So, you know, we're doing a quick two-week series on spiritual warfare, you know. Uh, so last Sunday, if you joined us, we asked the question, uh, who is the devil? Who is Satan? Um, you know, what's the difference between the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light as they overlap and intersect each other in this world? So we actually live uh, fighting a real battle. Uh, although it's not, you know, equal war, the enemy still does some damage. And what are some tactics of the enemy? And how do we, with the authority that Jesus has given to us, um, you know, defeat that, right? So today we're going to actually go into um, a very interesting topic on demon possession because I want to talk about what the Bible has to say. So, you know, before we go into this topic, uh, we actually have a video for you guys and uh, just kind of like set the stage. So it's from a really famous movie. So you guys are pretty familiar with it. But yeah, let's play the video and then we'll get started with the sermon. Somewhat lessened of late. Fair and king. He's not welcome. Why should I welcome you, Gandalf Stormcrow? A just question, my liege. Late is the hour in which this conjurer chooses to appear. Eurem, son of Thinga. Too long have sat in the shadows. Hearken to me. I release you from this spell. <laughs> <laughs> you have no power here, Gandalf the Grey. <laughs> <laughs> I will draw you, Saruman, as poison is drawn from a wound. <laughs> uh, if I go, Theoden dies. <laughs> you did not kill me. You will not kill him. <sighs> Rohan is mine. <laughs> Be gone. Wow, so cool, huh? Such one of the greatest movies ever made. If you have not seen it, you have to go see it, right? Can I get it? No, I don't want to get it. No. We're in a worship service. <laughs> we don't want to say amen on Lord of the Rings. So, because um, some of you guys were ready, huh? <laughs> you guys about to shout out amen. Um, you know, so, you know, we encounter a very interesting question today. And, uh, you know, today's going to be a little bit more teaching, you know? Uh, and, oh, let me kind of share, uh, you know, my study and what I'm about to share with you, I'm deeply indebted to a professor at Talbot, uh, Biola University, named Clint Arnold. So he used to be my professor. Um, I actually graduated from Talbot, and uh, he really taught me a lot about uh, spiritual warfare, yeah, and, and the demonic. And so um, I remember as I was preparing the sermon, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember what he said. So I went back and read his books. And I was just re-reminded re of just kind of like things that he shared. So deeply indebted to him, very thankful for him, a uh, great guy. And uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, we're going to tackle the question. So, you know, the question today is, can a Christian be demonized, right? Can, like, can a Christian be demonized? Someone who believes in Jesus, someone who loves Jesus, um, can a demon have control over that person, right? Um, you know, some say no. Uh, some say no. So, you know, they say stuff like, hey, we are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us. How can a demon and the Holy Spirit share the same space? You guys ever heard that argument before? Right? You know, uh, Holy Spirit and demon cannot share the same space. So, obviously, uh, there can be no demon inside of us. Demons can be outside of us, uh, harassing us, 
oppressing us, tempting us, but a demon can't be inside of us. So uh, a lot of people use the temple of God argument. Um, another group of people, um, they say this, hey, you know, once you become a Christian, you're owned by God. So, you know, God is your owner. So they tie ownership to possession. So if God owns you, um, how can a demon possess you? Because, you know, we belong to Jesus. We are owned by Jesus. So if we're owned by Jesus, how can you, you know, um, how can you be possessed by a demon? Because what they do is they tie ownership to possession. Now, a lot of the arguments that some people make, it's arguments driven by rationality and it's arguments driven by logic. But unfortunately, what I want to say is it's not arguments driven by scripture. Okay, so I kind of want to talk about that because our worldview tends to place as its emphasis rationality and logic rather than what scripture says, even though scripture in many ways is incredibly rational and is incredible logical, incredibly logical, okay? <clears throat> so uh, let me start here. Can a, you know, can a Christian be owned by a demon? No, no. Christians cannot be owned by a demon, why? Because Christians are owned by God, right? God is the master. Um, so, but what's really interesting is when you look at the gospel accounts, especially when you look at demonization or demon possession, the Greek word that the gospel writers use for possession never meant ownership. In fact, the Bible actually says that there's like five to six words uh, talking about different kinds of ownership. But, um, you know, when you look at demon possession, um, you know, like it, none of those words are ever used actually. It's actually a different word. So in the mind of the gospel writers, when they talked about possession, in their minds, they never tied that to ownership. But what we did it was we tied ownership to possession. So uh, although Christian cannot be owned by a demon, you know what the, Bible, the, the biblical writers say? Although a Christian cannot be owned by a demon, a demon can dwell within a Christian, unfortunately. There's a demon that could be inside of us, dwelling within us. Uh, how do I know that? You know, uh, the apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27, he's talking about <clears throat> the sin of anger. So he says there's righteous anger and there's unrighteous anger. And he says, don't give in to unrighteous anger. That's what he says. He says, don't give in to unrighteous anger. And then he says, well, there's a consequence now. There's a consequence that happens to a person who gives in and agrees to the lies of the evil one, which leads to unrighteous anger. And then this is what the apostle Paul says. He says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So he's basically saying, resolve it, forgive, uh, you know, uh, deal with it, find peace, repent, confess. So he says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And then he said, here's the consequence. Here's the result. If you don't deal with the anger that you have in your heart, unrighteous anger, he says, you give the devil a foothold. You give the devil a foothold. This foothold, this word in the Greek means tapas, and it applies inhabited space, right? So it's not the devil holding onto you from the outside, but the Greek word actually means because you're not dealing with your anger, the devil has entered inside of you and has taken a place inside your spirit. But the devil doesn't own you, right? So, and what's really interesting is the Apostle Paul, he's saying this, you know, Ephesians, if you guys remember the book of Ephesians, and you know, we're gonna go through a series in Ephesians uh, like after Easter, you know, in Ephesians chapter one and two, basically the Apostle Paul's talking about how blessed Christians are. He's basically saying Christians are, you know, uh, predestined and called and adopted and redeemed and forgiven and they're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And it's to this Christian, the Apostle Paul says, if you don't deal with your anger, if you're just like irrationally angry and there's just some people where like you just can't forgive and you just have so much hatred toward your heart toward them, the result of that is you've opened the door and you've allowed a demon to enter and dwell within your heart, right? So what do we learn from the scripture? Well, demons don't have ownership, they cannot have ownership, but a demon, according to the word of God, can reside inside of us and have control over us. That's why, have you ever noticed, like you know you ought to forgive, but you just can't do it? You know you shouldn't be angry, but you just can't control yourself? Right? 
You know you shouldn't be hopeless or depressed, but you just feel like you have no power to overcome it. What do you think that is? It's because you've allowed a demon to go inside of you and dwell within you and to inhabit a space in your heart. Now, does that demon own you? No. But does that demon have some sort of control over you? Yes. Is it total control? No. Is it powerful control? At times. Right? We need to let the Word of God speak into something that's really relevant to our lives. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 12, he says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. You know, what's really interesting is, like we take this verse and we interpret it not fully the way the, gospel, uh, the Apostle Paul wants us to. Right, so, you know, uh, basically the Apostle Paul, he's giving, us a, you know, he's giving us a warning, right? He goes, hey, don't let sin reign. Another word for reign is rule. Another word for rule is to have control. So basically the Apostle Paul is like, don't let sin rule. Don't let, you know, don't let sin rule in your heart, right? Don't let sin rule in your body, right? And, and you know, we tend to think sin is just only flesh, you know? Like, you know, sin is our, like, sinful craving and our desire for sinful things. But this word sin is actually a very general word that could imply devil, flesh, or the world, right? So basically, according to the Apostle Paul, what he's saying is do not let your flesh reign, do not let your flesh have control, do not let the world have control, or the Apostle Paul could be saying, do not let the demon have control. Right? Do not let the demon have control, that you obey its lust. So sin can reign. It can have a powerful control, powerful influence, but through different means. For some of us, that control comes from the world. Others of us, it, that control comes from our sinful flesh and others of us that control could potentially be demonic, right? We don't know, but what I'm saying is if you just completely ignore the demonic, then you might be like going to go see counseling and therapy and you know, uh, you might be wanting to read your Bibles harder and you know, uh, you know, serve more and go out to small group and there's always that nagging sense in the back of your mind that no matter how much you do, you, you seem to be chained, why? because we completely ignore the spiritual demonic realm that actually might have control over us. So we have to look at the scriptures. We have to look at the Bible to see what the Bible has to say. Because, you know, in our logic, you know, in our rationality, right, we say stuff like this. Oh, Christians can't be possessed by a demon, right? I, I don't know about you guys, but that's kind of how I grew up. People told me, oh, Christians can't be possessed by a demon. Christians can't be controlled by a demon, right? All we have to do is repent and confess, and everything will be okay, right? Uh, I don't know if the Bible actually says that. That seems like more of a logical conclusion coming from our minds rather than what the Scriptures teach us. Because when you look at the Scripture, there seems to be uh, this evidence of possession found in believers, in Christians, right? Uh, you know, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus, Luke tells a story about this crippled woman. This crippled woman was part of the synagogue. She sat under the Old Testament teaching of God's word. She worshiped God in the synagogue, right? Uh, she was a faithful member. And Jesus comes and she had this crippling disease, this, this back, you know, she was bent over. And she just thought it was a physical problem. And then Jesus looked at her and said, daughter of Abraham, which back then was actually a mark of salvation, and said, Satan has bound you for 18 years. Jesus applied her sickness to demons. So he cast the demon out, and now she's healed. Now, you know what's really funny is people read that and go, oh, yeah, must have not have been a Christian, <laughs> right? That's their, like, first response. Oh, must not be a Christian. Why? Because demon-possessed. There's nowhere in the Bible, in Luke chapter 13, when you go through it, that shows any evidence that person's not a believer. In fact, when you look at the passage, you would assume that person is a believer. Like, you know what I'm saying? 
Like you have to work hard to believe that person. The only reason why you would think that person's not a believer is because that person was possessed by a demon. Right? But then there's another passage. You guys remember Acts chapter 6, Ananias and Sapphira? Right? You know, the church is blowing up. You know, uh, thousands of people are coming to Christ. The church forms. And the Bible actually says the practices of the churches, they're devoted to God's word, prayer, the breaking of bread, and to the teaching of the apostles. You know who was a part of that devotion? Ananias and Sapphira. Right? Ananias and Sapphira. And then there was a time for offering. There was a time to give offering. And maybe Ananias and Sapphira, they grew up really poor. You know, uh, so, so finances had a deep control over them. You know, I, I know people who grow up poor, they have the hardest time tithing. They have the hardest time being generous because, you know, like they know the value of a dollar. So, you know, Ananias and Sapphira, maybe like they, they struggled with that. So, you know, but then they also struggled with shame and pride. So, you know, they saw Barnabas devote a whole field of land and they're like, oh, maybe I need to do the same. But they, they couldn't do it. So they only, you know, they sold the entire land and only gave half the profits. And then Peter looks at them and says, how has Satan so filled your heart? That's the exact word. How has Satan so filled your heart? Right? And so Ananias and Sapphira were possessed. But what's really interesting is we look at the scriptures, right? And we look at Ananias and Sapphira and we're like, oh, no, 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 no. They're not Christians. They're not Christians. Why? Because their, their, their hearts were filled by Satan. Where in Acts chapter 6 does it give evidence that they were not Christians? In fact, if you just read Acts chapter 6 at face value, you would naturally assume that they were Christians. They were part of the church. They were devoted to God's word, right? Just because you sin, does it make you not a Christian? Then none of us would be Christians here. You guys ever, like, not give your full offering one time? Right? I remember, like, you know, these little kids. Uh, I used to be an elementary pastor, and we used to do offering with elementary kids. And one kid put $5 down and took $3 back. Because, right? you know, he's like, hey, my mom only wanted me to give a dollar. I'm going to give $2. But I want 3 bucks back. Right? So, I mean, if we sinned and that shows we're not a Christian, none of us would be believers. Right? So what's really interesting about Luke chapter 13 and Acts chapter 6 is Scripture never says that these were non-believers. So we should assume that they're believers until proven otherwise, right? But then this is where we bring our rationality and our logic. We go, oh, no, 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 no. They must be unbelievers because they were possessed. Right? Did you know that the... Uh, that you know, Luke speaks of Christians practicing demonic arts. Right? The text seems to imply that Christians were possessed by demons. You know, in Ephesus, when there was a great revival going on, huge revival, Luke writes this. He says, part of the revival of Christians was many also those who had what? Believed. They believed kept coming and confessing and disclo disclosing their demonic practices. And many of those who believed, practiced magic, brought their books together. These are demonic books that they use to get into the demonic realm, to be filled with demons, began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they counted up the price and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver, which is like millions of dollars. Right? This was in Ephesus. Do you see how much demonic control was in the church of Ephesus? That's why the Apostle Paul had to write so much about spiritual things. Right? And remember, the key word here is this. They believed. They're Christians. Practicing the demonic arts on themselves. Right? That's why Paul says what in Ephesians 4? Don't give the devil a foothold. What does Paul say in Ephesians 6? Put on the full armor of God. What does Paul say in Ephesians 1? Jesus has defeated all the demonic realm in this world. Why? What's going on? Context. Because there's so much demonic practices by non-believers 
Well, yes, but also believers too. Right? So, um, you know, the Apostle Paul, he talks about a Christian that was caught by the devil. Right? So the Apostle Paul, he talks about a Christian that was captured by the devil. He actually uses the word, this Christian is captured. Right? So, you know, in uh, 2 Tim Timothy chapter 2, you know, he, he tells Timothy, he goes, hey, you got to talk to him. You got to give truth in a loving, gracious, and a humble way. Why? Because he might be freed because he's captured by the devil. So, you know, uh, so the Apostle Paul, he says, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been captive by him to do his will. Right? Captive. You know, so, you know, just, and guys, I, you know, there's so many more verses, but, you know, I don't want it to turn into kind of this, like, you know, verse after verse after verse, because, you know, seminary did that to me, and after, like, the fourth verse, I was like, okay, no, stop, please, you know? You know? So, you know, I'm just showing you, right, when you, when you kind of look at Scripture at face value, my conclusion is there were believers, believers possessed and controlled by demons, you know? And why do I say this, right? Because for some of us, we try to fix our problems by doing everything but renouncing the demonic activity that is in our lives. Right? I, know, I know someone who went to therapy for three years and they just could not forgive. And my conclusion was it's because it's a demonic practice rather than just regular healing that was needed, right? This girl, she couldn't forgive. Three years, couldn't forgive, right? She went through therapy, came out, better understanding of herself, better knowledge, better self-awareness, better practices, like better tools, better things to do to deal with her emotions. And every time she thought of that incident where she was hurt, she would flip into anger or depression and could not forgive in her heart. It's a demonic control, right? And never once did I hear her say, I renounce the spirit of anger, I renounce the spirit of for, uh, for, uh, unforgiveness in the powerful name of Jesus. Right? I'm not saying counseling's bad, but there are some of us, we tend to ignore all these things. You see, uh, there was this one guy, um, he said, it's kind of like this, like you're a house, you're a house, and Jesus enters your house and he declares that this house belongs to him. So that's what happens when you become a Christian. So salvation is Jesus enters your house and he says, this house belongs to me, you know, like Richard belongs to me, you know, like Jonathan who led worship, Jonathan belongs to me, you know? But he said, this house has many rooms. And what the enemy does, what the demons do, is they flee. And they go into one of the rooms and they lock the door. And, you know, they like, you know, they, they do havoc in there. And us, although we invite Jesus into our living room, we don't want Jesus to go into the kitchen. We don't want Jesus to go into the closet. We don't want Jesus to go into the bedroom. And that's where the demonic control is. And he says, to be freed from demonic control, we need to have, allow Jesus to have access to every single room that we're in so that his spirit may come into every room, cleanse out every room, and deliver us from every room that the demonic activities might be happening. Right? It's Jesus' house, but a demon could be in one of the rooms. So what do we learn? Yes, Christians can be inhabited and controlled by a demon, although they're not owned. I want you guys to know so that as you're struggling with something, whether it's anger or unforgiveness or self-doubt or self-hate or depression or sadness or judgmental attitude, whether you're looking at, you know, your attitude towards community, your attitude towards authority, your attitude towards yourself, as you're looking at all these things, incredible anxiety and fear every time you think about the future, right? Uh, maybe the issue is your sin. Maybe the issue is the world. 
But maybe the issue is there's a demonic spirit that you've allowed into your heart that has taken possession, that has taken inhabited space that you, by the virtue of maybe our ignorance or our rationality, we haven't kicked out. And we need to kick them out. We need to kick them out. So I kind of wanted to broaden out this understanding because, you know, um, my question to you is this. How do you read Scripture? You know, as Western Christians, you know, uh, as, as Western Christians, how do we read Scripture? And what's really interesting is the way a Christian from the Western world reads Scripture is completely different than the way a Christian from the Eastern world reads Scripture, right? It's completely different. And the way in our worldview, the way we approach Scripture affects our practice and our understanding and has both positive and negative impact. And what we need to do is to not read Scripture from a Western mindset or from an Eastern mindset, but to read Scripture in its totality the way it's supposed to be. Can I get amen on that? Right? Yeah. So what is the Western mindset, right? What's a worldview? Because I want you to know that every single person sitting here today, you read Scripture with a certain worldview. And that worldview is a set of presuppositions and assumptions we hold a lot of the times unconsciously that affects our interpretations, our emphasis, our evaluation, and our decisions. And, and the danger of the Western mind, the danger of people like us living in Western logical rationality-oriented society is this. The way we look at Scripture, we look at it with a naturalistic, materialistic worldview. We have a very naturalistic, materialistic worldview. So you know what that means? We're Christians, so we'll never say stuff like miracles don't exist, or healing doesn't exist, or supernatural doesn't exist, or demonic doesn't exist. We're Christians. We won't say that, but you know what we do? Because we have such a Western mindset, we minimize and we devalue the things that the Scriptures talk about consistently and clearly, right? You know, when you read about the demonic or when you read about miracles or when you read about healing, you're either skeptical, doubtful, you ignore it, or you go really fast past it because the gospels for a Western mindset is nothing but ethics, Jesus' teaching, and it's all about truth, right? Oh, how did Jesus live? Oh, I should live like that. Oh, what did Jesus teach about this? Oh, I should have that mindset. Right? So we highlight Jesus' teaching, we highlight his love, we highlight his service, because, you know, that's all about the West, right? But then when we see a miracle or demonic possession or healing, we downplay it, we ignore it, or we rush right past it and we don't emphasize it. That's a naturalistic mindset. That's a materialistic mindset. You know, there was a theologian, his name was Merrill Unger. And Merrill Unger, he basically said this, in the beginning, he wrote a book that says, Christians cannot be possessed by demons. So he actually wrote a book. And because he was so famous, that book was spreading everywhere. So everybody was quoting him, everybody was referring to him, everybody was studying him. So, you know, like he was a foremost authority, so it's just, it's just going and going and going. And he was like, yeah, Christians can't be possessed by demons. And he would use that argument, Holy Spirit, you know, can't be right next to, you know, demons. You know, uh, you know, if you're owned, you can't be possessed. So that was his argument, and he was, like, possessing it. And then something crazy happened to Merrill Unger. He changed his stance. And then he wrote another book, and he said, I was wrong. And he said, you know, um, you know Christians can be possessed by demons. And then so people were so confused. They're like, they asked him, they're like, hey, why did you change your stance? And he said this. He said, I took a closer look at Scripture, and then, but he said the main thing was all these Christians from, you know, uh, non-Western countries, so Christians from Africa, Christians from Asia, Christians from South America, they read my book and they came to me and they're like, hey, I know what you're saying. It sounds really rational and logical, but I can't help that my elder, this pastor, this child, this person in my church who passionately loves Jesus... I saw some sort of a possession happening. And this experience, I cannot uh, relate with what you're saying. And he heard so many of those stories, he, really, he, he was so shaken, he went back to the scriptures, reread it all over again, with what? With a different worldview, with a different mindset, right? He actually emphasized and highlighted the supernatural, the spiritual world, the demonic, the healings, the miracles. And then when he looked at scripture with a different lens all over again, he came to a conclusion that miracles do exist, 
and demons can possess people, right? So my question is this. If you're sitting here and you know, you're like, like, like the demonic has never been a big part of your life, right? It's probably because you read scripture and you live your life with a very materialistic, naturalistic worldview that you have seasoned with Christianity. So to you, Christianity is nothing but the ethical teachings of Jesus and serving in the name of love. Right? Some of us, we have a very rationalistic worldview. Right? So it's not just, you know, um, you know, it's not just a materialistic, naturalistic worldview. We have a rationalistic worldview. Like some of us, you know, like the lawyer types, you know, like the engineers, like we're so rational, we're so logical, everything has to fit, right? The mathematicians, like the science people. Like, you know, we love clarity. If things don't make sense, okay, forget it, then it must not be true, right? And some of us are like that. You know, we're very, like, you know, systematic, right? Um, so, you know, so for us, when we read the scriptures, we have a rational system. We, we have a logical system, and we fit everything into that system. So, you know, if we're really honest with ourselves, right, if we're re- the, the rational, logical people, if we're really honest with ourselves, right, the foundation of scripture understanding is not necessarily scripture, but it's our rationality, Right? So we say stuff like this, things have to make sense. Things have to make sense. If things don't make sense, then I'm not going to believe it. Right? Now, I'm not saying the Bible doesn't make sense, but there's times in Scripture where it's super rational, super logical. Right? And, you know, this is where we have to ask the question, do we fit Scripture into our rationality or logic, or does Scripture form our rationality and logic? So, for example, demon possession. Christians can't be possessed by demons. That makes no sense. Therefore, right, you know, uh, Christians and demons can't be in the same heart. Therefore, Christians cannot be possessed by demons. That's rationality. That's not scripture. Right? So what's primary? Is it scripture or is it logic? You know? So, you know, um, I don't know if you guys heard this before, but there's this thing called systematic theology. And systematic theology is your way of trying to order and organize what the Bible has to say about all these different topics. But the danger of systematic theology is no matter how much of a system you create, it's never going to completely explain the totality of Scripture. But some people hold to systematic theology more strongly than biblical theology or what the Bible has to say. And these are the people deep in their hearts, they value rationality more than the Word of God. Right? Am I boring you? You know, I'm so excited. Yeah. You know, so, you know, so how do you approach Scripture? Do you, do you read Scripture with a naturalistic, you know, uh, materialistic worldview? Where, you know, you read the Gospels and, like, to be honest, you know, the main takeaway is always, like, Jesus' love and Jesus' teaching, never Jesus' power. Right? Or... Do you read scripture and when things don't make sense, you just discount what scripture is actually saying? Right? And I want you to approach scripture with a humble heart and constantly readjust your worldview so that your worldview is informed by scripture rather than letting scripture go through your worldview. Okay? So, you know, going back. So, can a Christian be possessed by a demon? Yeah. So scary, isn't it? So sad. There's some of you sitting here today and a group this big. You could be possessed. I don't want to scare you because, you know, like, I'm not saying, like, you have no control because he who is in you is greater than he who is of this world. So, I don't want to scare you, but I want to lead you to a reality. In fact... In fact, you have an authority that no demon in the world can stand up to. You have an authority that no demon in the world can stand up to. And I want you to exercise that authority in Jesus' name so that you may truly be free. You may truly be free, right? Because that's what it's about. It's about freedom. It's about freedom. 
You know, what we learn about the devil is he is a tempter and an accuser. The devil is a tempter. The devil is an accuser. So that's basically how he works. You know, uh, I don't want to call the devil a two-trick pony, right? But the main instruments that he uses, he uses temptation and accusation in that order. Always the same. He uses temptation, and then right after temptation works, he uses accusation. And the purpose of this is because he wants to have control. Because the more control he has over you, the less control God has over you, and you can't live the beautiful life that God intended for you. So that's what he does. He tempts, and then he accuses. He tempts, and then he accuses, ultimately for the purpose of control. Our job is to break that control in Jesus' name. Right? So the devil tempts you. He comes in with lies to bring you to agreement. Everything is hopeless. Yeah, you're right. You're so inadequate. You're right. You suck. You're right. That person sucks. You're right. Circumstances suck. You're right. That's the devil's job, to bring you into agreement. And once you come into agreement, the devil comes into your inhabited space, and he resides there. And you would think the devil would stop, but guess what? Once he causes you to sin, now he brings his other hook, which is accusation. So he says this, hey, right? You know, um, isn't this enticing? Don't you want to do this, right? You know, um, isn't this great? Don't you agree with me? You're right. And then right when a Christian agrees with the evil one, the Christian naturally, because the Holy Spirit of God is living within them and the Holy Spirit is grieving, the Christian naturally grieves. And as the Christian naturally grieves, the devil takes advantage of that and brings another punch, which is called accusation now. And the devil says, you are so unworthy. Look at your shortcomings. Look at your inadequacies. Look at your sin. So the devil tempts, the believer yields, the devil gets a foothold, the devil accuses, the believer yields again, the devil gets a greater foothold, and through constant yielding, constant tempting, constant accusation, the Bible actually says a believer can be held captive by the evil one. Okay. And what happens is it's through yielding. You give in to the temptation and you give in to the accusation. And what the Bible says is, with the power that Jesus has given you, you gotta break it in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen on that? Right? You gotta break it in Jesus' name. Right? So how do we find freedom? How do we find freedom? James chapter four, verses seven and eight says this, resist the devil, resist the devil, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know how you resist the devil? You call upon the authority that Jesus has given to you. You resist the devil by saying, devil, demon, in Jesus' name, I renounce you, get away from this place, I don't want you anywhere near me, and guess what? The devil has to what? Flee. That's the word of God. And then what do you do? The devil no longer has control over you. Now you draw near to God in prayer and in worship, in obedience, in faith, in community, right? In scripture. And as you draw near to God, what does God do? He draws near to you. Why does he draw near to you? To heal you, to restore you, to reconcile you, to redeem you, to fix you, to make you whole. So what does it mean to draw near to God? You cleanse your hands. Right? You purify your hearts. Right? And the Bible says, yes, it's true. We might not want to. We're constantly tempted. But as you resist the devil and draw near to God, our house, the space of our hearts, will now be filled by the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want you guys to do. Right? That's what I want you guys to do. Especially, especially if there's anybody here struggling with unforgiveness. Right? Is there anybody here struggling with unforgiveness? If there's anybody here struggling with anger, if there's anybody here struggling with self-doubt, self-hate, self-loathing, if there's anybody here that's struggling with hopelessness and sadness and depression, and you just can't seem to break free, you just can't seem to, like, you know, just get out of it, right? If there's anybody here that's struggling with lust, and you just can't break out of it. I want to encourage you today. Resist the devil. And say, spirit of anger, spirit of unforgiveness, 
spirit of hopelessness, in Jesus' powerful name, get out of my life. I don't want you here anymore. And then after that, by faith, draw near to God in worship. Draw near to God in obedience. Draw near to God so that he may cleanse your house and he may cleanse your heart. And may that be the constant battle of your life. Amen? Right? Yeah. So, as you know, as I invite the praise team up, let's go into this. Let's go into this and, you know, ask the Lord today. You know, ask the Lord today. Um, say, Lord, is there something unholy that's controlling me? Um, is there something unholy that has taken up space in my heart? You know, for some of us, uh, what's really interesting is, you know, they call it the demon of dumb and deafness. It's like anytime something spiritual happens, you can't pay attention. You know, um, I remember I had a friend in college where every time a um, sermon, he would fall asleep. Like literally every time. And, you know, beginning, we're like, we like laugh about it. And, you know, we're like, what's wrong with you, man? You know, come on, dude. Like, stop it. And he goes, and he's like, oh, like, you know, he goes, I'm going to try next time. I'm going to try, you know. And then he's like, dude, I'm going to drink a coffee. And they drink a coffee and fall asleep. And, you know, we just thought it was funny. We're like, dude, what's wrong with you? But, you know, he's a good guy, right? Loves God, you know, just, just could not pay attention. You know, and it's not just one time, because, you know, like, I mean, you know, I mean, if it's one time, don't be like, you know, demon, like, you know. This is constant. And then I remember, like, after a while, this pastor was, like, you know, like, doing a deliverance prayer on him, and he changed. He changed. He was like, oh, I, I understand now. Oh, I could listen, and, like, I don't feel sleepy or distracted. I could focus. So for that guy, it wasn't discipline. It wasn't like, you know, uh, self-effort. It was deliverance, you know? So I'm not saying, you know, we all have a demonic problem. You know, some of us, we need to go see counseling. Some of us, we need more discipleship. You know, we need more prayer. We need more word, you know. We need more service, you know. We need to learn more, grow more. We need more obedience. But some... It is demonic, and we need deliverance. So I want to encourage you today. You have authority. You have power. By faith, a demon cannot stand up against you because you are a powerful child of God with the power of the Holy Spirit coursing through you. And all you have to say is by faith, demon of this, demon of that. I renounce you. Get out of my life. Okay. And then when that freedom happens, now you could go see therapy and counseling and go to a Bible study and go to worship. And I promise you, you'll feel so much more cleaner. Right? You'll feel so much more freer. You know, demon of depression, demon of sadness. Now, um, you know, there are, some, there are some where, you know, the Bible actually talks about this, you know, this kind can only come up by prayer and fasting, right? So there's, you know, different degrees. It, it could be that for years you've been yielding, you know, for years you've been yielding. And this is where I want you to have the courage and ask people to pray for you. Now, you don't have to go to them and be like, you know, hey, can you cast out a demon out of me? Yeah, you don't have to say stuff like that. But you, you should say stuff like this. Hey, you know... I've been really having a hard time forgiving and I really haven't forgiven this person in like five years. And I know I should and it's just so hard. Can you pray for me? You know? And, and keep availing yourself to that. You know, you say, hey, you know, uh, I've been trying to shake it off but this feeling of sadness has been with me for like six months and, you know, I'm trying to shake it off and it's been hard. Can you pray for me? And this is where the body of Christ comes around and enjoined authority now where two or more are gathered in his name he is with us the power becomes stronger so i want you to practice that pray for yourself and others to and ask others to pray for you you know i want to encourage you you know um 
our church, we're going to do a, a prayer week this week. So Monday through Thursday from 8 to 9 p.m. every day in the main sanctuary. Uh, come and pray. Come and meet the Lord. You know, come draw near to him. And come and lift up the friend, you know, um, that you want to invite this coming Sunday to Palm Sunday and pray that God would open their eyes, right? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I invite you to that. You know? So, and then after, if there's anybody who needs prayer, please come up. We have prayer ministers, and please come up and receive prayer. So, um, you know, Clint Hardo, my professor, a long time ago, you know, he said, you know, the best way the best way to defeat demonic activity is when the church of God comes together and prays together. So let's do that. Let's pray together. You know, let's, let's pray together in Jesus' name, right? So let me pray for us. And then, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's really hear the things that God has to say to us. Let's pray. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, we renounce and we expel any demonic activity in this place today. In the powerful name of Jesus, we expel the demon of anger, the demon of unforgiveness, the demon of lust. In the powerful name of Jesus, we expel the demon of hopelessness and sadness. We expel the deaf and dumb demon. In the powerful name of Jesus, we expel any demonic activity here. Demon, because of Jesus, you have no place here. We renounce you. Get out of here. Get out of the people of God. Father, we pray the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation. And Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may there be forgiveness today. In the power of the Holy Spirit, may there be peace rather than anger. In the power of the Holy Spirit, may there be hope rather than hopelessness, joy rather than sadness. In the power of the Holy Spirit, May there be a healthy, God-centered self-image rather than self-hate. In the power of the Holy Spirit, may there be a biblical view of community rather than a warped, sinful view of community. And in the powerful name of Jesus, Lord, shine your light and bring us into the light. Father, if there's anybody who don't know you here, open their eyes, Lord, and show them the truth and the beauty of who you are. So God, we pray that you would break the hold that the enemy has over us and that every house in our room, in every room in our house would be cleansed and sanctified through your presence. So we thank you, Lord. Deliver us, Lord. Bless us, Lord. Bring your presence here. Do your powerful work. We thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise together for worship and prayer.